Good evening. It's good to be back with you again this evening. We've got some visitors tonight who are with us, and so we're, we're very thankful that you've chosen to be here with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, Ronnie Milliner is here, and, and Ronnie filled in for me at Anderson this morning, so I'm so thankful that he's come down here to hear, hear me this evening. I've known Ron for a long time and his family, and um, Ron is a great Bible student. I've learned a lot from him, and um, always always good to see him. Um, <clears throat> good to see Candy, folks from Belleville are here, folks from Southside and Crawfordsville are here. Um, we've got visitors from all over the place. We have people from Evansville this morning and Kokomo, and so it's just great to see people from other congregations come and support other congregations in gospel meetings like this. Um, I hope that you're bringing your friends and your um, neighbors to come and hear the word this week as we'll be thinking about various moral issues tonight. I'd like to talk to you about something that I'm, I'm getting to where if I have the opportunity to work this into a, a week of meetings that I, I like to preach it because I find that parents and, and grandparents appreciate the reinforcement and you know this isn't just a kid thing though. Adults have issues controlling um, how they operate and work with social media and uh, the World Wide Web, and so hopefully some of the things we talk about here tonight will be helpful to you. Um, <clears throat> I want you to start by looking at a couple statistics here. Uh, as you look at the total population of the world as of January of 2023, there's about 8 billion people in our world. And if you look at that little green circle, you'll find that about 5.44 billion of them have mobile phones. So two-thirds of the world's population are using mobile phones. Another 5 billion are using the internet and 4.76 billion of those are active social media users. Um, social media, if we define what that is, I think most of you kind of know what it is, but um, it's a form of electronic communication like websites for social networking and microblogging through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content like videos. Uh, the first known use of the term social media was in 2004, so you probably didn't hear a whole lot of social media sermons before that because it's a rather new phrase um, the last 20 years, we've been talking a lot about social media. Here are some of the most popular social media um, applications or platforms uh, as of 2022. Facebook is still the largest platform for social media as of 2022. Um, YouTube comes in second. Um, there's also WhatsApp, which is one that I'm not really on, but I find that when I've gone to other countries, um, they all ask me if I'm on WhatsApp because it's a cheap way to communicate um, to people um, internationally. Um, Instagram would, would come in third. Um, Facebook Messenger is next, and then there's a WeChat, and then TikTok. I'm not even going to bother with all the rest of them because I think most of us probably have heard of or are on one of uh, the, the five or six that we've just mentioned there to the left. But there are lots of different platforms people can get on um, to, to look at social media. I want to quote to you from this book, Terms of Service, which I recommend to you if you have the time to read it sometime. If you, you know, you're into reading real books still. Does, do people still do that? Um, but but this, this quote says this. After all these years and plenty of cautionary tales about the negative effects of the social internet, we all continue to log on. Why? What makes Americans check their phones 96 times per day? That's how many times the average American checks their phone. 96 times per day or once every 10 minutes. There's two primary factors that keep us coming back to the social internet. Number one is the fear of missing out. FOMO. It's the same problem that we've been having since Genesis 3. Right? Why did Eve partake of the fruit of the tree that she wasn't supposed to take of? Well, Satan said, hey, you know what? You're really missing out. 
you need to take some of this. You need to have this. God just doesn't want you to be, you know, wise. God doesn't want you to experience this. She felt like she was missing out. She participated. Why do we feel like we need to be on every social media app? Well, sometimes it's just we're, we're missing out. This person's talking about Facebook, and I'm not on Facebook. This person's talking about something they saw on their Instagram account. I'm not on Instagram. This person's talking about a, a, a reel that they saw on TikTok, and I'm not on TikTok. Um, and then the other problem is just addiction. We're addicted. Um, so we want to think a little bit about this addiction that a lot of us have with regards to social media and our phones and technology and our iPads here today. I, I want to say this. You can look at all these statistics and some people say, well, I just wish we'd just get rid of the phones and get rid of the iPads. Look, it's not going away. Social media is not going away. We need to be talking about it and discerning how we can rightly handle it. And we need to consider our moral obligations with regard to our screen time. In the social media world where people follow others, it is important for Christians to be reminded of who we really should be following. Jesus says we ought to take up our cross and follow him. If anyone, he says, would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So how can I rightly follow Jesus and still handle social media? So today I want to think about a few principles with you, principles that apply whether you are on social media or not. Some of these questions are going to apply to other scenarios beyond the social media world. We're going to use biblical principles, biblical principles that were written at a time where there wasn't social media yet, but it certainly applies to how we use social media, that they're going to help us shoulder our cross in a hashtag world. Um, and so let's look at some of these biblical guidelines so that we can be in the world, but not of the world. So I have 10 questions for you today to ask yourself, or maybe to ask others as you study this topic um, with regard to social media. Number one. God expects us to redeem the time, to use our time wisely. So a question you'd ask yourself is, am I redeeming the time? Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And what do wise people do? They redeem the time because the days are evil. They use their time wisely. Jesus says this, um, in Matthew 6, 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Jesus says, in our lives, we should be seeking first the kingdom. But how many people, when you wake up in the morning, seek first the phone? Um, if you're going to redeem the time, then you're going to have to be disciplined with your time. If you take a look at the statistics that I just skipped over, this... Ask the question, can you recall the last time your phone was not within earshot? You take a look to the far right there, 25% of people that were surveyed said they never can recall when their phone was not close to them. One out of four people were addicted. We're not getting away from our phones. And sometimes we are wasting far too much time on our phones. I went to a young people study yesterday at Southport with a couple of my daughters. And while I was there yesterday morning, um, the person who was teaching the study was talking about Stephen Covey's seven, uh, seven highly, you know, uh, what was it? what's the title of that book? Yeah, seven, just shout it out. You know what it is. Seven habits, habits, that's the word I was missing. Seven habits of highly effective people, okay? Well, one of those is using your time wisely. And he uses the time uh, matrix, in, and he shared that with some of these young people that were there, which I thought it was good. He said, here's four different ways you can categorize your time. Um, you can say that this is urgent and important. Some things in life are urgent and they are important. The other matrix is there are some things that are urgent but they are not really important. Then there are things that are not urgent, but they are important. Things that you need to get to. It's not really urgent, but you get to them right now. But then there's things in the far bottom right-hand side of that quadrant that are not urgent, and they are not important. And when you ask those kids, you know, what are some of the things that you would say are not urgent, not important? One of the kids, very honestly in the back, said, um, all the things that we're doing, you know, <laughs> scrolling our phone, 
looking at TikToks, um, looking at the latest IG, Snapchatting, uh, playing video games, watching Netflix, all the stuff that we're doing are, are, are things that are not urgent and they're not important. And we need to spend more time thinking about things that are urgent and important and important, right? Um, are you redeeming the time? Uh, a few years ago, I was, I was asked to be in a fantasy football league up in, um, up in Kokomo with some of the members up there. And I'm a very competitive person, okay? And I, I took fantasy football way too seriously. So Mondays, I would spend like three hours checking the waiver wire. If you know fantasy football, you know what I'm talking about. But checking the waiver wire to see what free agents I could pick up to add to my team to get rid of the ones that weren't producing. I got asked to do that, and I lost still. I still you know, didn't even come close to winning the league. I was terrible. Next year, they asked me to do it, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I said, why? I said, I'll tell you why. Because I'm spending too much time checking the waiver wire on Mondays when I should be studying my Bible. I've got sermons to prepare and, and articles to write and, and Bible classes to get ready for, and I'm tired of wasting time doing this. And sometimes we need to cut things out that are wasting our time. Um, we waste time. Um, there's other things that we could be spending our time doing. Let's see what some of those things might be. Notice what Jesus was spending his time doing. In Luke 4, 16, as busy as he was, he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Jesus always made time for worship, made time for that. One of the most discouraging things as a preacher to me personally is when you get finished with your sermon and you wonder, where was so-and-so tonight? They weren't there tonight. They weren't there this morning. They didn't take time to come to worship, but you found posts that they made time to make on their social media page. Is that really a good use of your time? Do you think it would be a better use of your time that you would be together with brothers and sisters and trying to soak in the word of God? Taking more time, studying his word, and praying with other people and for people, encouraging brothers and sisters. Maybe we need to be more careful about how we use our time. I don't want to just talk about worship, though, and taking time for worship. We could also waste time at work. We can waste time at work, and when we waste time at work, work productivity is decreased. There's some workplaces that have taken away the phones or where you get disciplined for pulling out your phones, right? In the Bible, there's a term for that. It's called pilfering. When you're on the clock and you're supposed to be working and you are instead on your phone and not accomplishing what your boss is expecting you to accomplish, you are stealing from your employer. That's pilfering. When you milk the clock playing games online and neglect your duties, you're stealing from your boss. You need to redeem the time. <coughs> we can waste time at home. And meanwhile, the relationship with our wife and kids diminishes. You talk to people sometimes, even sometimes people in the church, and they're having relationship problems. Um, why? Because, well, my wife is just always on her phone. Or my husband, he just comes home, and all he does is just sit there, and he turns on the TV, and he just watches the TV. TV all night in his recliner until he falls asleep, and he does the same thing overnight, over and over again. 1 Corinthians 7 says that husbands and wives need to render the affection due one another. Sometimes your husband or wife just needs your time, needs your conversation, needs your ear, needs you to pay attention to them. Sometimes we get robbed of that time because we're paying attention to media, various mediums. We have our face in our phones. We need to make sure that we're redeeming the time. Jesus in Luke twenty two thirty nine 39 says that as he went out to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus made time. He made time for worship. He made time for prayer. And so are we redeeming the time? We've only got so much time, so we need to spend more of it in reality, not virtual reality. Let me notice the second question with you, and I could take a lot of time on all these questions. But I've only got so much time as well. So second question, do my posts reflect a selfie-ish mindset? Mindset. This is also from Terms of Service, and Chris Martin writes in here, we have come to believe if it is trending, it is important. 
And we ought to give it our attention, no matter how insignificant or downright foolish it may seem. Likewise, we have come to believe that how much attention we receive is an accurate measure of how important or valuable we are. We take pride in our followers. We tend to think the more followers you have, then the more popular you are. And the more popular, popular you are, the more relevant you are. We take pride in our followers, the number of likes we receive, and how many people retweet our ideas. My daughter was looking through our church's um, Instagram page, which we've begun posting a few sermon clips and things like that on there for the church. And she said, Dad, you've only got like 12 likes on here. Man, you're not very popular. You know, the truth isn't very popular sometimes, Hattie. So, so it's amazing, though, isn't it, that you post a picture of a, another actor slapping a comedian in the face, how millions of people will view that. You share something about the truth, and, you know, five, six people have seen it. Popularity isn't always a good indicator of right and wrong. It doesn't always mean it should be getting followed. But we think that way sometimes. We think somewhat selfishly and prideful when we think that way. The danger of being consumed with how many followers or subscribers or likes that we get is that we are in danger of thinking that because we have lots of followers, lots of likes, lots of hearts on our posts or our comment, then it must be right. But the truth is not everything popular is right, and not everything right is going to be popular. And Luke chapter 6 and verse 26, I share with you a passage that um, Brother, Brother Milliner preached at Anderson this morning because I just listened to a sermon a few moments ago. It says in verse 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. It's not always a perfect indication that you're doing what's right just because a lot of people like you and follow you. God calls us to avoid having a self-centered mindset. He calls us to be selfless, to call attention to ourselves, to call attention to our good deeds. It's an act of pride. Take a look at this picture here. I just got a little kick out of this picture. I didn't want to put any real pictures up, so I just used Woody. But sometimes it really can come across like you're really into yourself when you're constantly posting about yourself. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What does it look like when we're constantly posting selfies? Doesn't it kind of seem like selfish ambition? Doesn't it seem kind of like we're into ourselves? Here's me with my makeup. Here's me in my bathroom flexing my muscles. Here's me and I'm volunteering today. Here's me and I, I washed my hair and I brushed it out and I want you to see my beautiful hair. Here's me posing in my new outfit. Here's me working out at the gym. Here's me in my front row seats. Here's me eating ice cream. Here's me eating toast. Here's me eating a burrito. Here's me chewing gum. You know, and I'm not kidding when there are some people that are very much like that, right? Here's me and I'm with a celebrity today and I took a picture with them. For some people, it's all about me. And the pictures indicate that and what we post indicates that. You know, here's one of the awesome things about Jesus is we have never seen a real picture or photo of Jesus, and yet millions of people believe and adore him without ever having seen him. What is it that makes him great? Nothing about his physicality. It's not what he looked like. It's what he did for other people. It's that he served other people, and people admire that. In Matthew 20 and verse 27, this is what Jesus himself says. Clicker might have gotten stuck. But Matthew 20, 27, and 28 says, Whoever desires to be first among you, 
let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Our life needs to not be about ourself, but it needs to be about serving others. And I don't know, I'm trying to click both ways, but it's not. Does that, does that happen sometimes? Is this a technical thing? All right. Well, the sermon might be over quickly. Um, so, <laughs> I want you to take a look at one more passage that comes to mind when I think about this. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11. <clears throat> it says here that we should aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. The world doesn't need to know every detail about our lives. Uh, God encourages a quiet life. We also don't need to nose our business into everybody else's details of their lives. Because we're not supposed to be a busybody in other people's business. Lead a quiet life. Don't be so loud. Um, and think about what those posts may reflect. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you a third question, which is here on your outline. I can go hard. I've got the hard copy, so I can go that route if we need to, Gene. Okay. I'll ignore you. No, they won't. Nobody out there is going to ignore you. They're just going to be staring at you. But <clears throat> Sorry. Third question. Would others question if I have crucified the flesh? Turn with me to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. We'll take a look there. Would others question if I have crucified the flesh? If you look at Galatians chapter 5, it has the works of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. It has the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23. Verse 19 says this, The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This says the works of the flesh are, are clearly listed here. You ever see people post about some of those things on their social media? You ever see people who are posting pictures that are pretty lewd? I get kind of embarrassed when I see, especially when I see people who are brethren, they're posting pictures of dances they've gone to in extremely immodest clothing. And we're going to talk about that Wednesday night. But this passage condemns uncleanness and lewdness. Would other people question whether or not you truly have crucified the flesh when they see those pictures? Idolatry, sorcery, hatred. Sometimes we say very hurtful things when we're on social media. And you read comments. And I read sometimes, especially during COVID, this was going on big time. It happens. It happened during the political season. But we see Christians sometimes saying very mean, nasty things to one another. That just sounds a lot like they're having some contentions and they're real mad. You can just feel them, you know, pounding the keyboard as they type out their responses to people. Would others question whether you've crucified the flesh? There are people who can use the, their podcast and they can use their opportunities on social media to spread heresy as well. Um, and then there's people that sometimes they post pictures of themselves at parties. I've seen teenagers. I've seen teenagers who grew up in the church and I've seen teenagers who have left home and they're posting pictures at parties that they're at and everybody's drinking and alcohol's all around. And if I was their parent, I'd be pretty embarrassed, first of all, that I raised you a certain way and here you're acting like this. I, just embarrassing to your mom and dad, even if you're not a Christian anymore, it's embarrassing to your mom and dad. But it's embarrassing if you're a Christian to be posting things like that. What are the things that we should exhibit in our lives? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But others question by what you're posting, whether you've crucified the flesh. Those who are Christ, verse 24 says, have crucified the flesh with its passions and with its desires. Well, another question that I'd ask that's on your outline there is, do I like what God would like? Do I like what God would like. Romans 1, 28 through 32 says this, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what 
ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they may not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. We need to be careful that we don't give approval to those who practice sin. And when you heart something that's spreading an anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-biblical agenda, then you are giving your approval to something that God does not approve of. Do I like what God would like? When I like a picture of someone who is dressed and wearing immodest clothing or um, is carried around that bottle of alcohol, um, am I liking what God would like? You know, or am I giving my approval to something God would not approve of? These are questions we need to ask. Sometimes, you know, and sometimes it's accidental. We share things that have you know, curse words or swear words, or people are talking in ways that Christians shouldn't talk, or they're taking the Lord's name in vain. Should we give our approval to that? Um, so, what others question if I have crucified the flesh, and um, do I like what God would like? I skipped one, didn't I? Yeah, you guys saw it on your outline, but I didn't notice it, so back up to number four. Am I making a private issue public? Am I making a private issue public? That's another question that I think we need to ask ourselves as we think about this topic. Um, Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, teaches us how we should deal with private issues. Um, it says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more. There are some issues that don't need to be addressed publicly. Some issues that need to just stay between the people involved. And it doesn't need to go any further than that if you can resolve it between just the people who are involved. There are times Jesus took his disciples aside to discuss issues that even the unbelieving world didn't need to hear. He showed discretion in taking them aside and say, let's talk about this just with one another. There were times that he privately addressed others because it was a more appropriate format. And there's clearly times where he commands that we do the same thing. Your Facebook thread is not always the best of places to discuss any and every Bible topic even. Uh, I, I'm not sure that, that Facebook is conducive to a study of whether we take the early or late date on Revelation. I don't think there's enough characters for, that I, that I, for me to type. Um, that that's a good place for me to have that argument. I don't think Facebook is a good place for me to be calling out the church for all of my unbelieving friends to see that I'm stirring the pot and I'm sowing dissension amongst my brethren. I see that. I see that from preachers who need to show better sense. The reason why I don't do stuff like that, I've got friends who are outside of the church and I don't want them to see that kind of discord. They don't need to see that. That's going to turn them away. Why are people going to be drawn to the church? Well, one of the things Jesus said is when they see your love for one another and when they see your unity. But when we display a lack of love and disunity in such a public way, we can sometimes push people away from Christ and from his church. We need to be careful about that. Um, sometimes some topics are too heavy for the social media format. Um, and so things need to be taken off. Line. But it's more than just religious topics. Uh, when it comes to politics, we don't have to blast our politicians or leaders every time a decision gets made. Because guess what? I don't really know if Donald Trump or Joe Biden's reading my Facebook thread. So it's not doing a whole lot of good, is it? If I decide to use that as a format that I'm going to blast those things out there. If you really want to make a difference, you can write to your politicians and to your leaders. You can send them mail and email and you can even make phone calls. That might be a better way to handle the things you don't agree with. You can show up to school board meetings. You can go to town council meetings. 
and you can deal directly with the problem rather than just throwing those people under the bus every time you don't like a decision that gets made. Go and actually handle it in a way that might be productive. It's going to help your marriage if you don't embarrass your spouse every time they do something that's annoying to you or silly. The whole world probably doesn't need to know that, and they may not appreciate that you let them know that. In parenting, we don't have to embarrass our kids every time they irritate us or disobey us or they play the prodigal. Not everybody needs to know. At work, I don't have to throw my coworkers and boss under the bus when, we, when I have a bad day at work. With your team, I, I, had, I had a daughter that played a lot of soccer and we did a lot of travel soccer and all that sort of thing. And, and one of the things that, that we were always preached at before the season is, please, if you have a problem with your coach, don't go to social media with it. Please talk to your coach about it. That's a much better way to handle it. Your coach is really not going to like you or your family if you keep publicly embarrassing them. Who likes that? Just the golden rule would teach that, wouldn't it? And it would help your church. Don't use social media to blast your preacher or fellow Christians or, or a church member when they get under your skin. Don't make those passive-aggressive posts that everybody knows is pointed at somebody. Go talk to them and have a conversation about those problems. Uh, deal with your issues as privately as possible without ever making public mention of them. That's what um, Aquila and Priscilla did with Apollos when they heard him preach something that wasn't right. They just took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. They showed discretion and tact in doing so. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love. He who repeats a matter separates friends. Let's make sure we're covering the transgression. All right, I already mentioned number five. Let's move to number six. And I would ask young people this question. When you post something, consider how will this affect my future? How will this affect my future? Now, we do need to have an, an ultimate goal in mind when it comes to our future. That ultimate goal is heaven. That's the most important part of your future that we should be concerned with. Hebrews 12 says we should run the race with endurance that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Um, Paul said one of his ultimate goals was I'm straining forward to what lies ahead, and I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is to be prepared because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. That is our ultimate goal. So we need to keep our eyes on that. Don't do anything um, that is going to compromise your ultimate goal. But you also need to think about how your social media use can affect you in a couple of different ways. First of all, you can really shoot yourself in the foot with your earthly goals when you use your social media inappropriately. Everybody... From college recruiters to CEOs, they are using your social media pages to gauge whether or not they want you on your team or they want you working in their business. And so you need to be careful what you're posting just for those reasons as well. Uh, we, we have a lady that's been visiting our congregation in Anderson here recently, and uh, she was talking about how she got this new job that she's had for the past year or so. She said, I was working in a in a cell phone store as a salesperson and somebody came in there who ran you know this other business and they came in there and they met me and they learned my name and he she, she said that they left and they came back a day later and they said you know what I've I've met you and I really like who you are I also looked you up on social media and I really appreciate how you present yourself there and I'd like to offer you a job and the job was substantially better than the job that she had and so she took it and she's very happy there how did he look her up? Well, he wasn't telling her. I went and I was going to go look up your social media, but that's what people do. And if you're posting things which show that you've got a bad attitude, that you're talking bad about your workplace, why would they want you to come work for them? You throw your coach under the bus, why would that coach want you on their team later? They're looking at those things, and you hurt your reputation when you're sharing those things in your future. Um, and so we need to consider those things. It's also, it may even hurt prospects prospects that we might want to teach the gospel to by some of the things that we say and the ways in which we display ourselves on social media. We need to be careful of that. Um, seventh question that we've got, are my words grace to others? Now I'm talking about verbal morality 
on Thursday night. So I'm just going to walk through this quickly. But are my words grace to others? Is what I'm saying um, uh, moral in a verbal sense? So I want you to think about a few rules. First of all, does this word do anything to progress something positive in this world? Matthew 12, 36 says, I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Is what I'm saying advancing the kingdom, bringing people closer to God, or is it idle talk? What about Ephesians 4? Um, the Ephesians 4 test is, would your words grieve the Holy Spirit? Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Is, are your words corrupt? Is what you're saying corrupt or does it build up? It's one or the other generally. Here's the Philippians 2 test. This is the verse that I had my kids memorize when they were little. And I still ask them to quote it to me sometimes. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Are you complaining? Is this just you complaining? Because the Bible says you shouldn't be complaining. Philippians 4 tests. Brethren, whatever things are true. Is it true? Is it noble? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it a good report? If there is any virtue in anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's the Philippians 4 test. Are my words grace to others? Here's the eighth question. Do you need to keep what you're looking at? Or the conversations you're having a secret. Secret. Now here's why I bring this up. Take a look at these statistics. Take a look at the 87% of all teens are online statistic. Take a look at the 80%. 80% of 15 to 17 year olds have had multiple hardcore pornography exposures. 8 out of 10, 15 to 17 year olds. Ninety percent of eight to sixteen year olds have viewed porn online. Nine out of ten. Eight to sixteen year olds. There's some people here who work in the schools. You know what's going on. You're hearing kids talk about it. You know the IT guy at the school is having to deal with it. And is seeing it show up on their computers and he's seeing it show up online. It's a problem. So just a simple question that I think we all should ask at what we're looking at, the conversations we're having is, do we need to keep this a secret? Do we need to keep it a secret? Because if you would be embarrassed that your wife saw your web history because of some of the things that you're looking at, you shouldn't be looking at them. You'd be ashamed if your husband saw what you were looking at. You shouldn't be looking at it. If you would be scared to death if someone took your phone out of your hands right now and said, let me look at everything that you've been looking up on YouTube and let me, let me bring this into a computer guru and have them go and, and look at all the history of it. Let me dig into the cloud and let me see all the pictures that you've been taking. Let me look at all the conversations you've been having. Let me see some of the conversations you've been having with that coworker at work or that, that, that whoever it is. If you would be scared and embarrassed for somebody to take your phone and look at the conversations you're having and to look at the web history and to look at the, the websites you've been looking up, then this is the question for you. If you need to keep it a secret, you shouldn't be doing it. And the simple fact is that nothing you do is in secret. Because even if you get away with it right here on earth, God knows. We serve an omniscient God. And Ecclesiastes, the last chapter, says that at the final judgment, everything that you thought was in secret is going to be brought to light. Even Jesus said that. He said in Luke 8, 17, nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. If you're doing something that would bring shame to your mother or to your father, you should question whether or not you should be doing it. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 14, one of the things that 
was said to David when he thought he had had a secret affair with Bathsheba. He, he is told by Nathan the prophet, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. When we do things that we think are in secret and then it comes to light, people find out about it and it embarrasses us. Well, we've given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Many politicians have fallen prey because their emails, their subscriptions, the things they thought they were doing in secret, they were exposed. And you might not have, never have a news story printed about you. Sometimes when people find out that you've not been living the life you've been professing and claiming to live, it brings great embarrassment to us. I've heard of guys when I was in Kokomo for 15 years, there were a lot of people that worked at Chrysler. I remember people telling me that there were people at Chrysler who would carry two cell phones. One cell phone was for their family. The other cell phone was for their mistress. And the wife never was around the other cell phone. It's dishonest. If you've got to delete a message as soon as you send it. My kids aren't on Snapchat. The reason why they're not on Snapchat is I hate the idea that you post something and then it disappears and no one can see it. We're not doing Snapchat. That's just not allowed in my family because it is too easy to post things that you know your parents want to like and then for it to vanish and you have no proof that it ever happened. So we don't do that. If you're staying up late at night so that you can look at things that you know that you would be ashamed of, if other people saw you accessing it, then you shouldn't be doing it at all. And so do you need to keep it a secret? It's a question that we could ask. Every secret thing is going to be brought to judgment. Um, another question, how is this affecting my heart? I'm going to deal with this really quickly, but sometimes you know that the things that you're looking at um, are, are triggering you. They're triggering anxiety. They might be triggering depression. They may be triggering jealousy in your heart. If that's what's going on with social media, then sometimes you need to just delete it and get away from it. Don't be afraid to just get rid of it. My wife took a long Facebook vacation for a long time because she said, you know, there's just some things that are really irritating me. I think it was during political season. And she said, I'm just much happier when I don't see all of the foolish things people are posting. So I just deleted it for a while. Well, I'm afraid we might have to do that about every two years. And then when political season starts, we, we go back on. And, and when <laughs> How is it affecting your heart? Bad company corrupts good morals. That includes your communication that you do online. Our first commandment is to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbors. And if it's affecting our heart in a negative way, we need to get off of it. Well, the last one that I want to take some time with as we conclude is this. Are you using technology to share Jesus? Because I don't want to give you the impression that everything is bad about social media. I, I, I think some of the things that, that we're doing in, in Anderson, I know... Um, things that we've done in other congregations, I, I think we've done some good things. During COVID, I had a trip that was planned to, to go to Barbados and to preach there, because I preached there two times, and, and I had to cancel that trip two times during COVID because it just kept getting rescheduled. I didn't end up going. Instead, here's what we did. We had a Zoom gospel meeting, and we had way more people at that Zoom gospel meeting than we ever would have had had I actually gone there and sat in a building and we did it a lot cheaper. We had people from, I mean, like probably 20 countries who were watching this week-long gospel meeting, which was about premillennialism, a question that they had down there. And so that's what we talked about. A lot of people were interested and were watching. Are you using technology to share Jesus? There are people... When we started live streaming sermons when I was in Kokomo, there were people who I never for years could get to come into a building, but I saw their name pop up and they were watching me preach online. And it's easy for you as Christians when you have a website and your sermons are being recorded and you know there's a lot of other good material out there from other congregations too. It, it's really easy just to hit the share button or to copy and paste a link and send it to someone. Share the gospel with them. I heard someone saying that here at the potluck today, that I've got a friend I've been trying to get to come. I can't get them to come. I said, well, if they won't come, then you send the message to them. Let's see if they'll read it. 
or listen to it or hear it. It's pretty awesome that I wasn't in Anderson today, but I've already listened to the sermon that was preached there while I sat in the parking lot for 30 minutes. And I, I did that on purpose. I came early so I could listen to that sermon before I came in here. It's great. Awesome. I learn from a lot of different preachers now. And there, there's opportunities that you know, preachers didn't have you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago to learn from other people. Two you know, billion people are on Facebook. A good chunk of the world is using that platform. If you've got 300 friends on Facebook, then that's 300 opportunities to share the gospel. You can share a spiritually minded article. You can share a sermon. You can share an inspiring Bible verse. The young man that was sitting up here in the front, um, James Carter, when he was living in Coke, and he lives in Evansville now, but he was here this morning. And one of the things that I thought was really neat about him when he was in high school is there were some other teens and we were thinking of ways that we can encourage one another. And something he just started doing on his own every day was he just started sending a Bible verse to all the teens through a text message every day. I thought it was awesome. It was just a simple way that he was trying to do what he could to encourage people. We can send out invites to special events through social media. Um, we can get people to look at our page and to to look at the opportunities that are coming up. We can share gospel songs. There's some awesome a cappella singers out there. Introduce people to good a cappella singing. Share that with them when you hear some of those online. Encourage people through song. There's a lot of things that we can do through social media. Now, is some of that going to fall on hard ground? Yeah, some people aren't going to pay attention to what you're posting. Some of people are going to like it, and then they're going to forget about it. Um, but there's going to be some good and some honest hearts out there. We just, in the past um, about six weeks, where I'm at in Anderson, we've, I started noticing, you know, people, if you watch YouTube and if you watch analytics, people don't really watch the full sermon usually. They just don't, especially my sermons because sometimes they're long. And <laughs> but people will watch a one-minute video. I, I watch tons of little one-minute videos from all kinds of preachers. So we started doing that. Started putting out these one-minute videos. Uh, we went, the first couple ones that we did, we went from having, you know, 10 or 15 views on a sermon to having 1,000 on a one-minute video. People are watching it. Some of those people that were watching that one-minute video, some of them were, were sharing that from our congregation. They were sharing that on their social media pages. And even in the past month, we've had people from other congregations showing up to our congregation because they say, I heard more Bible in that one minute than I hear an entire sermon where I'm at. Share it. People are watching it. And you can do some good by putting a little bit more energy into social media. So are you using your technology to share Jesus? We can use. It's pretty awesome. I can check on people who weren't at church because they were sick or they're not feeling well. I can send them a text so I can check on them. Every day, there's somebody that I can encourage. I know somebody is down in spirits. I can send them a message. I can do that through Facebook Messenger. I can do that through all kinds of platforms. Encourage one of their daily. We can do that through social media. Uh, Mark 16, 15, 16 says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. I think social media in some ways has been a game changer for overseas evangelism. We can do some things that we weren't able to do a few years ago and at, at a lot cheaper cost by doing it that way. So are you using your technology to share Jesus? I want to finish with this question, and then we'll be finished. Colossians 3 says this, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I want to ask you this question. As you... Take a look at what you've been posting on Instagram and Facebook and other things like that. Would people say that person's life is all wrapped up in Jesus? Or would they even know that you're a Christian? This passage says Christ should be your life. And if Christ is your life, you've got nothing to worry about when Christ comes back again. So is Christ your life? Is he your everything? If he's not your everything, I would encourage you, you can use this opportunity as we offer this invitation to make confession. We can pray for you. If you're not yet a Christian, you can use this opportunity to be buried into Christ in water baptism, raised from the waters of baptism, 
a new creature sharing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the hope that presents to us. If you're ready to make that decision one way or the other, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.